Well, good morning. I'm uh, David Robinson, neurointerventional neuro radiology VM. I've been doing endovascular treatment, neurovascular disease for about 20 years there. And um, so I'm going to tell you about um, mostly, well, exclusively ischemic stroke and thrombectomy and how we're treating that uh, from my perspective. And I'm going to bring you from the very beginning up to the cutting edge, what's going on right now in patient selection and so on. Um, so it's pretty much a visually oriented thing. I just want, I hope you'll find this interesting and compelling, what you're going to see here. Just kind of sit back and relax and I'll take you through the history of this and where we are now. So um, very briefly, so we're all on the same page. It's always a good place to start with these terms. So here's a nice diagram of an ischemic stroke in progress. And it's showing the embolus, so something that's floated up in the brain and blocked an artery to the brain and then the territory distal to that, it's not getting enough blood flow. And that blue area uh, is depicting what we refer to as the core. So the core is what you're already too late to save. The blood flow is so low that the brain tissue is already irreversibly injured. And it only takes about five minutes for the brain to be irreversibly injured if there's no blood flow. So the key in most of these cases is there's a little bit of blood trickling in there that keeps the brain alive long enough for us to restore blood flow. And the whole, uh, the biggest concept to understand here is the core is growing, okay? The core is spreading over time. And so it's uh, going to ultimately grow into, uh, typically, this area that we're trying to save, the target of therapy, the penumbra. And so we're trying to save the penumbra, trying to understand how much of it is irreversibly injured and uh, whether there's any penumbra worth going after. And the core, the part that's irreversibly injured, also might carry risk of turning into a hemorrhage after you reopen the vessel. So this idea of the core and the penumbra are central, and that the core is growing, okay? Um, so these are images, <coughs> images out of things we sit down with patients and their family as we're doing these cases. Nice place to start is just review of the anatomy. I don't have the pointer with me, but that's a pretty nice diagram of the two big arteries in the front, the carotid arteries that supply the front two-thirds of the brain which is most of these cases. And then the two arteries that go to the back of the brain, shown on that diagram to, the, to your right, that go along the spine and form a single artery at the base of the brain, the basilar artery that supplies the posterior one third. So we refer to that as the posterior circulation. They present differently. The posterior circulation ones would be uh, problems with vision, gait, unsteadiness, consciousness, uh, double vision, eyes that aren't tracking together, that sort of thing, where the anterior circulation is usually hemiparesis, hemi, hemi neglect, and uh, maybe paresthesias on one side of the body, half of the body, and speech. And uh, eye, eyes fixed off to one side. And also on that diagram to the right is the connections between those arteries at the base of the brain, the circle of Willis, which frequently comes into play when you lose an artery, that's one of the main reasons we can get alternative routes of blood to the brain, is that circle of Willis that provides some backup it's kind of like the beltway around Washington, D.C., where you can come in any one path and go around the circle and get out another path to supply some part of the brain that may have lost its primary artery. But the thing to know about that is that's variable in terms of its completeness. Some folks don't have any component of it, so every artery is off on its own. So we assess that, and it becomes frequently you know, very uh, central. Um, so how we do these cases is cerebral angiography, which is as I'm sure you know, get access to the crease of the top of the leg there into the femoral artery and guide the tubing up into the aortic artery. We don't go down to the heart, but we select and select each of these arteries that head up into the brain and do an angiogram. This um, <clears throat> frontal view of a cerebral angiogram is showing um, the artery opposite the side of the occlusion, and the red arrow is showing to where the artery was plugged. If you were going to check the other side, you would see a plug. But a later image shows how the arteries coming down or the surface of the brain are coming in backwards into the ones that would have been fed by the artery that was on the other side. Do you, you folks see that? I can't uh, point what maybe I have there. So those are peel collaterals. <clears throat> and those are central uh, to uh, keeping the brain alive long enough for us to work. So this patient might have a full-blown right hemisphere presentation but those arteries are keeping that brain long enough, alive long enough for us maybe to get in and open that, but not sufficient to keep it you know, alive indefinitely, so they are gonna have a big stroke if we don't intervene. So this is a, kind of a key concept. 
So there's biplane or ranch geography suite. Um, so it's a significant you know, investment to install something like this. They're not everywhere, but this is the kind of thing you need with a lot of uh, fancy electronic processing and then x-rays from the front and side simultaneously able to generate 3D rotational angiographies in very high detail where we see basically 3D models of the arteries of the brain, aneurysms, and that sort of thing. And then navigating up in this territory for treatment of stroke. So <laughs> I've been doing this for a while, as I said, but this really uh, took off. The real breakthrough was in 2012. We had devices. We went up and gave, gave TPA intraarterially at the side of the clot. The idea being, I'll skip several slides here, but that when you give IV TPA, it just washes through the brain where it's open. It doesn't go into the occlusion where if you walk with a microcatheter, you can deliver clot right to the obstruction and get through it and break it up. Um, and we did pretty well with that. But this device in 2012 was a complete breakthrough compared to everything else that had been um, produced before the solitary device. And so what this device is, is sort of like a stent, but it's uh, still attached to its wire, so you don't leave it behind. You can deploy the stent and then pull the stent back out, essentially. And the idea, and it was quite deliverable, that you could go up, get across the clot with a microcatheter, and then uncover the stent, and it would do two things. One, it would open up, and that lets some flow through, so all of a sudden the brain is getting some nourishment, some bad maybe nourishment, but then you let it sit there for a little while, and when you pull it out, not infrequently the cold clot comes out with the, the uh, stent. So we're actually able not just to break it up and send everything downstream, just to effectively remove the thrombus. Um, so here's a case from 2012 when that came out, 48-year-old young man up on top of some palming passes, getting ready to uh, work, and went down, was found, they think, you know, probably within minutes of him going down with dense left hemiparesis, hemi neglect, and right rotates. So that's what we're talking about here. Droopy face, looking off to one side, and, and uh, totally paretic kind of a patient, may or may not be able to talk. That's the kind of stroke patient that, that we're really, can really help. Um, so gauge preference, hemi neglect, hemi paresis. So uh, the stroke scale, as you know, 0 to 41 is this scale that assigns a severity score. And we're usually uh, looking at either in single digits or up into the mid-20s would be a pretty bad stroke. So a you know, stroke scale of 21 would be a pretty bad stroke. We rarely see scores higher than that. So this is a pretty bad stroke. It's going to leave this guy disabled for sure, or almost certainly. And here is his non-contrast CT. And what we're seeing here is an encouraging pretty normal CT by the time he got to us. We'll look at the timeline. But those arrows are on the middle cerebral artery that looks dense compared to its partner. So we call that a hyperdense MCA sign. And this was recognized years ago as a sign that there's probably clot or slow flow in that artery, that it's a large vessel occlusion, and it's probably not going to do very well just with IV TPA. So he uh, <clears throat> goes to the angiography suite. What I'm pointing at there is an internal carotid artery occlusion. So that big front artery that I showed you on the original slide is supposed to be heading up towards the brain. The one you see there is the external carotid artery. The internal carotid artery is completely out with just this little bird's beak there. And then up above that, there's an occlusion of the middle cerebral artery as well. This was obtained later after passing through the internal carotid artery, but he had tandem occlusions of the carotid artery and the middle cerebral artery up in the head. So <clears throat> this is us then working on that. We quickly get through that uh, occlusion. In this case, there's a distal protection device to prevent any emboli as we work in the neck, which is probably the offending lesion. Put a stent across that um, to gain access. And then this is a nice image of a solitaire device deployed. So those little dots on the arrow are the end of the solitaire device. The ones I'm going to show you later have multiple series of those dots. Um, but you see how it's let flow go through. And the faint part is where the, the thrombus is. So you see the contrast coming up, then it gets faint because that's clot. But there is some contrast getting out to that brain, which there wasn't there before. So we let that sit for you know a few minutes and pull it out. So it's like the image that I uh, showed you of how these are supposed to work. It's the equivalent. <coughs> And this is what we get out in the little strainer is a bunch of clot. And this is the artery just after one pass. I mean, this was a miracle. That would have taken a long time <clears throat> to break up with TPA and so on. Here in one pass, it's uh, fully open. Um, and the CT right afterwards is normal. That's pretty extraordinary. Um, <clears throat> we might frequently see a little bit of something, but this one is totally normal. And then here's this guy the next day. <laughs> with a stroke scale of one, you know, asking to go back to work. So this young guy that would have been disabled and, um, you know, maybe in a nursing home is now asking to go back to work the next day. 
Um, so that's what this is all about. Uh, so what we've learned along the way is, it, since it is all about time, or that's a, certainly a, a big part of what's going on here, is to keep uh, fairly strict tabs of every increment of time, every interval. And that's how you guys can help is look at every interval of this, the uh, process. So it's not just, say, door in, door out time. It's how long from one step to the next. So in this case, um, this guy, <clears throat> because he was up on top of Snoqualmie Pass, it was already three hours before he got to us, so 183 minutes. But then we got a CT done in 15 minutes. He's in Angio in 32, maybe a little longer than absolutely required. 10 minutes later, we got a first run and um, took a little while, while to stent that carotid, but then with the solitaire, eight minutes, first pass, and we're, we're done. But you see how that adds up? Even this guy is five hours. So he must have had reasonable collaterals to make it that long. Um, <clears throat> so after that device came out, basically, um, what we're seeing on the left half of the slide are some attempts to show endovascular treatment as being the better way to treat stroke, and there were lots of problems with the way those trials were done, but they were just sort of equivocal. They weren't strongly positive, so people were losing enthusiasm. But then between 2014 and 15, five large randomized trials came out, all dramatically positive for this therapy um, in uh, <clears throat> a magnitude that was essentially a first in the history of medicine. To have five randomized trials published in one year with the strength that these trials had had never happened before. <clears throat> so pretty incredible. Um, time to watch that unfold, something we've been working on for a while to sort of bloom like that. So what they found is just basically, you know, better study designs, faster times, working, getting those times down, patient selection and better devices and more experienced teams and more efficient teams. We we're just getting better outcomes. Um, <clears throat> so here's a depiction, it's kind of hard to look at all the numbers. This is a nice way to look at some of these outcomes is you take 100 patients and so it's, you know, 100% and then you just depict 1% as an individual patient and assign some color to an outcome. So in this case, this is the benefit from giving IV TPA just by itself. And what you're seeing is the green are good outcomes, um, near normal, and the light green is better but then the red colors are, are worse off. So what they found with, or what the results are with IVTPA is, if you give you know, 100 patients IVTPA, 13 more will be nearly normal than would have been if you hadn't done it. Um, 32 will be better than if you had, including the nearly normal or just better than, that, that, did seem, that seemed to benefit. Um, but there will be some that suffer from in addition to what would have happened from the therapy. So there'll be six patients, six more, that will have intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, three of them will be worse off for it and one will be dead. So there was a cost to that therapy. It's not risk-free. Giving IV TPA has some risk to it. But in general, because of the benefits on the top, it's worth it. So if we compare that to now this thrombectomy strategy, which definitely um, can go after IV TPA, that's very common. Um, we have more people, 20 nearly normal, more people better, and no increase in morbidity or mortality. So not that someone can't have a complication from that procedure, but there aren't excess um, worse outcomes. We're just saving people. So also very encouraging. And then I spoke about the power of the uh, treatment is shown here where one of the ways to look at this is called number needed to treat. And what that is, is how many patients do you have to treat to save one? It's the number needed to treat. And so here are some common sorts of procedures. What we're looking at in these trials is three to seven. That's pretty phenomenal. You think, well, you have to treat three to save one, but that's pretty phenomenal in, me in medicine. For taking someone to the cath lab um, that has a STEMI, it's 45 to 91 for prevention of short-term mortality to, sa to save a life in the short term. If you're giving somebody antibiotics for septic shock, it's four. So, uh, you know, we're talking about the antibiotic range of benefit for in someone with septic shock. Uh, so it's pretty incredible. For, say, uh, carotid endoterectomy, six to 15 number needed to treat. So it's a very, that we refer to that as power. It's a very powerful therapy. The next thing that came along um, <clears throat> in terms of technology was this, what you were playing with out there, was this ability to suck the clot out. So they developed catheters with um, just advanced uh, in catheter engineering that wasn't available at first that we could actually deliver that were big enough 
to suck clot out. So this was a failed case of the thrombectomy. Sometimes you'd get the solitary and you pull it, you pull it and it just won't come out. So this was a case where we went up with this suction device. And so you saw the canister out there, you hooked to the suction, that's the catheter. And this is what we pulled out. So you suck, it's like a drumstick, part of the clot into the tubing and then when you pull it out the whole thing comes, comes out, looks like a drumstick. And uh, so in this case, <coughs> Um, turned into uh, was a complete normal flow after that. So that's the aspiration. So, uh, you know, now we're just more and more commonly, we kind of expect this in a good imaging um, leading into the case and a large vessel occlusion to get results like this where the patients are basically restored to near normal. Um, so all of those patients had large vessel occlusions and high stroke, scale, high stroke scales. Um, so now, just now we're going to dig in. So that's the basic thing. I'm um, going to grab a chair over here because I'm kind of just got this knee injury I'm recovering from, and it's I'm going to take some weight off this knee. I was mountain biking and just got an MCL tear. Uh, that's better. So um, <clears throat> all right, number needed to treat. So we don't want to get too. Uh, everyone's like, oh, that's just the, the the gold holy grail is the number needed to treat. The lower the better the therapy, but that isn't necessarily true. So here's the uh, four trials, the endovascular treatment trials, and um, it's showing you know number needed to treat uh, with uh, the green being you know how many you have to treat to get the one safe. And compared to say PCI for prevention of stroke death or MI uh, is 17. These had in the range of three to seven, but you know, does this mean that, that between those two trials in the center that the extend IA is better than the escape trial because it had a lower number needed to treat? And that is not necessarily the case, and that's what I want to show you here. Now, this is a real busy slide. We're not going to spend time on it. I'll show you what you need. The point is they just um, did a sort of a thought experiment where they took the last thousand patients that came into their hospital, and with all the data that they had about those patients, decided which trials they would be enrolled in, which would qualify to go to the angio suite, how they would have likely done, and so on, and whether they would even made it into the angio suite. And what they found was with about 1,000 patients, there's, they get kicked out for one reason or another, you end up with about 100 that would have gone into the angio suite. And then <clears throat> if you took those uh, 100 of uh, those patients into each of the trials, you get this sort of a thing that we'll zoom up on now, where there's the 100 patients that went to angio, the green ones are the saves, the red ones weren't much better, um, and the gray ones, you know, no improvement. And what you find is that um, it, it, it's, there's just, it's apples and oranges in a way, because if you look at scenario number one, which was the Mr. Clean trial, they took a lot more patient, patients to the angio suite, but they saved more than some, so it becomes a question of resources, you know, what's more important, how many patients you can save, um, or having a low number needed to treat. Um, <clears throat> so for scenario number four, there were fewer patients taken to the angio suite, this is the SWIFT prime trial, and um, so that would have a relatively low number needed to treat, but they didn't save as many, see? So it's not that simple to just talk about number needed to treat. And they all had different sort of criteria about how long they extended the window and so on. So the only number that really makes sense is how many patients you save in the community, not how many take to the angio suite, it's how many we can save and with what resources. So of these, the attractive looking ones look like scenario number two and five, where they did pretty good in saving the most number of patients without taking too many to the angio suite, even though those might not have the lowest number needed to treat. Do you guys follow that? Number needed to treat is how many you took to the angio suite. That's not the denominator that's important. It's uh, how many strokes are in the community and how many you can save. <clears throat> okay, so the next uh, thing that's big concept here is so all of this you've heard, you know, be fast and time is brain, right? I'm sure you've all heard that, time is brain. And this has been a dictum that has been, you know, present forever. Time is brain. It's been shown over and over again. Here's a nice graph of descending likelihood of good outcome versus time um, uh, with the probability on the left and then time on the scale of the right, and the longer out you go, the less chance you are going to have a good outcome. It's about 3% for every 10 minutes, um, or 18% for 60 minutes, and that might be exaggeration, I think, Fatima told you about 2 million neurons per minute. So that's still a lot of neurons per minute. So time is brain. And another trial, another published uh, result, same thing, time is brain. Uh, here's another one where it shows that same decreasing slope, and you see the number needed to treat going up 
So you have to take more and more patients to the cath lab to save one as you go out further in the time frame. So time is brain. Um, <clears throat> so um, that leads to this sort of a thing, which was an analysis of all those little increments I told you about. This is from a Stratus trial that we were part of, a registry, where they looked at, uh, you know, so if you look at the bar on the top only, and you see 31.5, that stroke onset to 9-11 call, and then eight minutes is 9-11 to the EMS at the scene, and so on for every increment, going to the hospital, getting image, going, going to get an IVTPA, going to the cath lab. And what they're showing on the top <coughs> is patients that went to another hospital first, and the bottom is went straight to an endovascular capable center. And so what's in the red box there is the additional time from stopping at another hospital first. So one of the things that came out of that trial is if you don't do that, you save 100 minutes. Uh, so it led to a lot of interest in maybe we should not be stopping at uh, local hospitals and go straight to an endovascular center. Well, that all depends on the transport time, you know, between the two. But if they're right next to each other, certainly you would think that would be true. <clears throat> And that's led to this, which you've heard a little bit about today, is how to triage, how to figure out that the patient has a large vessel occlusion just by looking at them and examining them or might have one so that you would go straight to a big center and skip the local hospital. And there have been lots of <coughs> scales proposed, you know, race and lambs, and you know, you've heard some of these things. Uh, but the issue is trying to not have too many false positives or negatives. For instance, if you look at uh, lambs over here, all it's really doing is testing motor strip. And the problem with that, because it's just weakness uh, of, the, of a limb and I think uh, basically one half of the body, is it can have false negatives because there's more on the cortical surface than just weakness and maybe weakness isn't the most prominent part of this person's stroke. And the other is you can have weakness with just a lacuna or infarct that isn't a large vessel occlusion, so you get false positives. So both false negatives and positives would be expected to be higher with the LAM score. Um, where this one on the top that uh, we find intriguing, the VAN score is quick and easy and tests for more cortical areas. So you would think it might have better sensitivity and specificity for picking up a patient that likely has a large vessel stroke or a large vessel occlusion. So those studies are ongoing about what the best way to do this is. It's not probably too relevant here, <clears throat> although I was hearing even now patients that are kind of halfway between here and Seattle are going that way for that reason. But uh, if, say, you know, Yakima ended up having endovascular capabilities, maybe with this sort of a strategy, they would go straight there and not stop, you know. But uh, because right now, local stroke cases are going to start year first, so they can be assessed, get NCT, because it gets into that transport time when you're this far away, it's better to stop because you can get IV TPA start, started and get some imaging done. Um, okay, so all about time. Time is brain, time is brain, time is brain. So then just recently, in the last year or two, you've probably heard about this extended window business. So there were two trials published, one is Dawn and one Diffuse 3, where they extended the window way out, 24 hours. So IVTPA, let me tell you, isn't it really uh, multiple trials tried to go more than three hours and failed over and over and over again. Then they got one that's like four and a half hours if you're careful uh, in one trial, and that's been the limit. With IVTPA, they started at six and really have never had a negative one, but no one was extending way out like this. And so this was a whole, you know, sort of paradigm shift to extend the window out 24 hours. I mean, that was unthinkable. So that's a dawn trial, and Diffuse 3 was 16 hours. So there are two reasons why these trials were dramatically positive. Look at the number needed to treat. 2.8, extraordinarily low. 3.6, also very low. It, what that tells you actually is they're probably not treating enough patients. It's almost too low, right? You probably could have treated more and let that number needed to treat come up a little bit to save more people. So there are two reasons for these seems like, you know, counterintuitive things. How can you say you can treat a stroke out 24 hours? And the two reasons I tell you right now, and we'll show you uh, examples, but one were wake-up strokes. I never agreed with, you know, we don't know the time of onset, we're not going to treat you. You have a normal CT, large vessel occlusion, you know, favorable imaging, but we're just going to sit and watch and you have a major stroke. I mean, that was just craziness to me. So we did treat some of those patients. So a lot of these, in fact, many of them are just really unknown time of onset. So they may not have really started their stroke 24 hours ago, they just don't know what the time was, and now they can get treated because they're doing some imaging to show that the patient should be a reasonably good candidate. And the other thing that's come out is it turns out, partly because of that circle of Willis or various other 
the peel collaterals, that there are patients that have better collaterals than others. So there are slow growers and fast growers. So some people, you don't even have two hours, and some people you might have 12 or 14 hours. So those are the two reasons that we can now extend our treatment paradigm. But the <clears throat> technology that led to this whole concept was just more advanced imaging in selecting patients. And so this is an example of one that's used, which is a automated CT scan that uh, is CT perfusion. So they're looking at the flow of blood through the brain and showing that quantitatively and then they have come up with, you know, through multiple iterations, the best way to try and predict what's going to be penumbra or tissue at risk and what's going to be core. So they make it real simple. Red is core, green is penumbra. Okay, obviously this is a best guess for a certain time frame, like at about six hours, if the patient, that core is growing, right? So if you did this in a patient that just had a large vessel occlusion, it would be totally irrelevant because you have plenty, you have a few hours to work. But so what, what turns out that the average application of this is in around six hours or a little more. So at about six hours, it, this thing's calibrated to show you what it will predict the stroke will be if you don't do anything, which is the green, and what's probably you're already too late to do, which is the red. So we would call that predicted core. And then since the core is also within the penumbra, we can't just call that penumbra. You'd superimpose them to get the penumbra around the core. You guys following me? Mm -hmm. But it is um, tissue at risk, we call it. Okay? So that's how they did it. They picked these. They did use this to let patients come in that had just woken up, even though maybe they should have been doing that all along just by looking at the CT scans. And so it gives you a ratio of the two volumes, and it gives you um, the uh, volume of the, dif the difference of the two volumes, and uh, we use those criteria to select patients. You know, but basically you can kind of just gestalt. That looks like a lot of brain that could be saved, and not too much that we're probably, you know, have already lost. We should go for this. And I don't care what time it is, because there it is right there. I don't care if it was, you know, 24 hours. Okay, so that's all fantastic, but I don't want to mislead people because uh, it gets the problem, you know, raises the problem of wrong messaging about, you know, the headlines say, we now have eight more hours to treat strokes. Like, no, we now have longer, patients now have more time, so people relax about that. That's not true at all, right? That's not true at all. So, and to emphasize that, is this um, another one of these little hundred patient uh, sort of uh, diagrams that shows you the difference. If someone, the, the top black on the left, shows up within 30 to 60 minutes, most of those patients are gonna qualify. Most of them have favorable imaging and could be taken to the cath lab and have their artery opened. If you go to the two to four hour window, a lot fewer, they're gonna start to have abnormal CTs and things that are gonna exclude them. They're gonna have too much core. And then if you go out even six to nine hours, even fewer will qualify. So, and then, you know, the bottom shows you that you take them to the cath lab or you get IV TPA and you save the green ones. You know, when you combine the two, IA, IV, that's how many you saved, about half, more than half in the 30 to 60 minutes. So when you get out six to nine hours of actual time, not unknown time, and actually they just woke up with a stroke an hour ago, but they know it was six to nine hours ago, you're, you don't have that many patients probably that you're gonna be able to save. So a lot of this is a lot of uh, effort and a lot of publicity about maybe a relatively small number of patients in that setting, right? So we shouldn't be putting all our resources into trying to figure out which of those few patients we are gonna be able to save. We should be shifting the curve this way by acting fast and getting patients more likely to be able to be saved. Does everybody get that? Yes, we have more time, partly because you don't know when it was and they actually just happened. They fell out of bed because they just had a stroke and some people have good collaterals and go longer than others, but that's kind of diminishing returns because there are fewer and fewer people that are gonna get out 12 hours and not already be too late. Okay, so that's super important. So here's the deal with this now, because now we keep pushing this, all right? So now we have you know, more time um, <clears throat> and uh, selecting patients by imaging ones that we would have excluded before. So where does this end? All these trials, they were uh, designed with a good outcome meant normal or near normal. Uh, you know, basically you go back to work. Or maybe if you wanted to be um, liberal, you know, you're functionally independent even if you have some deficits. But uh, here is the outcome scale we use, rank and scale. And so zero is normal. I've done highlighted the yellow ones to just give you a bottom kind of line. Number, uh, one is you have some deficits, but you're, you know, pretty much, uh, you can do the same job. Two, uh, you have impairments, you may not be in the same line of work, but you can, you're independent, okay? You can take care of yourself. That's a big deal. That's our bottom line there is what we want are functionally independent patients. Three, okay, I need some help, but uh, I can walk. 
I can tell you a lot of happy patients that you know are in that category. It's like, yeah, my wife needs to help me with my checkbook, but I'm still have a you know very satisfying relationship with my grandchildren. So you know, well worth living. Four, now I can't walk. I need some help to walk. Five, I'm bedridden and fully dependent. Nobody wants that. And then six is dead. Okay, so uh, what we really want, we'll assign those colors, <clears throat> is we want to take people that would have died and make them normal. Those are the kinds of ones I was showing you, right? Home runs, there's no question. That's fantastic. But, um, you know, even if you were going to be bedridden, but now you can walk, I mean, that's worthwhile. I mean, most people would take that. Um, and uh, certainly because they weren't going to die anyway, they're just better off. Or as you go down the scale, you know, we're just moving them up a few um, marks on the Rankin scale by saving that penumbra, even if it isn't a, to a total home run. Um, now, this is one or death to can't walk. Well, that would be a personal choice. I think many people would take that. You know, I can't walk without help, some sort of a device, but otherwise I'd be dead. Now, what we don't want to do is make them worse, right? So we go down the scale, we make someone who would have done pretty well and make them bedridden because you have some complication from your procedure. Certainly we don't want that. But also, <clears throat> we may probably don't want, you would have died, but now you're going to be bedridden and fully dependent. Most people probably don't want that. So it is uh, accurate uh, to say, as we tell many of these patients and their family, you know, what's the worst thing that could happen? You could die or worse. Okay, so many people would consider that worse than death. So we don't go out of our way to try and save people that would have died to make them bedridden. Okay, so, um, but then let's drill down a little bit on that. So a common universal exclusion criteria, even in those 24-hour trials, is a core of more than 70 mils of volume. So if that's that big a core, then, you know, because <clears throat> you're not going to get a good outcome when you have that big a stroke. So what I'm depicting here is a common way they look at this, because it's not just binary, it's your rank and score outcome and how many patients achieve it. So at the top bar is people that had endovascular treatment with a core less than 70, and then the bottom is the, those that didn't get that. And what you're seeing is a shift of the rank and scales that more and more people are to the left. And so it's basically best kind of understood by the slanting line. So that slanting line to the right shows benefit because there's more patients, say, below two. See that? So on the bottom one, uh, two and less is one place. On the top one, there's a lot more that achieved a lower rank and outcome. Is everybody following that? Because I don't want to go on until we get this. So you see in that sloping line. So less than two on the top is a lot better than those that are less than two on the bottom. So it's an effective treatment. Okay, well, let's look at the ones that were more than 70 mils of volume, okay? Again, with our little color scheme, which I colored the numbers there. The ones that are more than 70 mils, what happens is the zeros and the ones and the twos drop off. That's not going to happen. That's not possible. You're not going to get to be a zero. But instead of bedridden, you can ambulate, right? And so the slope of the line is even steeper. It's just that they're not going to be those great outcomes. So when you folks send to somebody who's already got a fair amount of injury, but a big penumbra, might be able to be saved, what we can do is just give them a lot better life than they would have had, even if they're not going to be like the ones I'm showing you where they were back to normal. And so this is still, still worthwhile. This is a whole new, we haven't even talked about that yet in opening this up, where we're taking strokes that are still fairly significant, but we can make them better because we can image the penumbra and sit down with the family and say, you know, well, this is what's going to happen if we don't do anything. Here's what we might be able to get if we try. And so <clears throat> um, clearly, even those with this universally accepted exclusion criteria still benefit, so that's yet to come. And so here's a little, here's a little mouse I do with that. Is it still over there? <laughs> that's a little movie if you want to click on that. So maybe this is the future when we look at this, you know, shifting rank and scores. This little thing I put together on a 3D CT perfusion. So we make a 3D thing of it and you sit down with the family and okay, here's what you got. The red is already gone. The green is what we might be able to save. We know the functional anatomy of that part of the brain. And we can tell you this is the likely outcome if we can save that part of the brain versus what's already, do you want it? Do you think you want to go for it? Right? And if it's going to be, you're going to be bedridden and fully dependent and can't talk either way, it's probably not worth it. Um, or they'll die if we don't, but if we do, they'll probably still be mute and hemiparetic and so on. And no, they, they've already, we know they don't want to live like that. So then you don't. So it's a rational decision, but it's way beyond what we're talking about now, you know, trying to make people perfect. Okay? So that's, you know, the, kind of the next thing. So then we get into the 100 
people diagrams of that sort of a thing, another way to show it. This one, um, I think, is less relevant than this one. This comes where we show them by ranking score. So what we're seeing is just less red, more green. And um, <clears throat> so what's happening, a lot of the, the ones that are on the left, which are the uh, didn't get treated, and the ones on the right got treated, is that a lot of the reds turn into yellow. So a ranking score of three. I'm telling you, that's not that bad. I mean, that, I think almost anyone would accept that versus dead. That's, uh, I need some help, but I can walk, you know. So, and that's, those would be considered bad outcomes in most of the prior trials. They were trying for better than that. So, uh, I think this is where we're headed, where we can rationally say, uh, let's go for it, even if it's, the goal is a rank and score of three. Okay. So, after that date, I thought I'd take a little break on this, because I was watching, um, Dr. Milfred and talk about the kidney and the you know nephrons above neurons. And so here's a concept for you. So let's talk about vital organs, okay? Those vital <laughs> organs you need, okay? The heart, okay, that's that's gotta be number one, right? That's a vital organ. Lungs, I mean you can't live very long without those. Um, liver, okay, another vital organ, and kidneys. So all those are vital organs, and then of course uh, the brain. Okay, what do all of these have in common? You can transplant those, okay? You can't transplant the brain. So there is no organ, anything like the brain. There is nothing more important uh, than your brain. Um, so uh, I say you can't, tra what? You can't transplant the brain, you, you know. Uh, I can tell you there will never ever be a brain transplant, <laughs> even though there is this surgeon in, I think he's in Russia, is promoting, it's been around for a while, he wants to do a brain, a brain transplant. And um, so he's gonna super glue, you know, the brain stem back together and, uh, and put someone, you know, a brain into a different body. And uh, so, you know, is that possible? It's in Newsweek, you know, doctor ready for first human head transplant. And he, they've got a guy who wants to do it. This Russian, actually, you know, oligarch type person who's got this terrible, you know, degenerative disease, look at his body, who wants to do it, okay? But I'm telling you, even if they were successful, that wouldn't be a brain transplant. It would be a body transplant, right? Because you are your brain, so you can't transplant your brain. You can get a new body, so your brain is you. And there's nothing, you know, that you, you can't transplant, transplant that, right? So they, maybe they'll do this, uh, it's crazy it seems, but it won't be a brain transplant. Okay, <clears throat> so, uh, the next uh, topic, this is just a paper to show you that there was one published about this before I show the graph showing the idea of these collaterals mm -hmm. and that it turns out there are different populations of patients that have different levels of collaterals and you can image it and you can figure that out ahead of time. So they did it, it's 554 patients, it was a meta-analysis. This is the graph. So it turns out, I told you there were slow growers and rapid growers just with a single phase CTA which is why it's so important. You cannot do a stroke, even first assessment, without doing a CTA, right? Not the non-contrast CT. CTA, preferably multi-phase, we'll talk about, but um, that just have poor collaterals, and this is showing how long you have to try and save them in the red. But then there's this other group, look at the dichotomy that just had good collaterals based on a single phase CTA, how much longer you had. So when we get these cases in tele stroke, where we're on the phone and we've got a patient that's got a head CT, maybe there's a little bit of injury to the brain already visible, maybe not. But we're looking at that CTA and looking at the collaterals, and if there are no collaterals, they're not gonna make it to Seattle, you know, those two, three hours, it's, it's basically a lost cause. Where if we see collaterals, that's when we say, if this is a go. This patient looks like they would benefit. So this is super important. All right, so here's a recent case. It could easily be from here. This was a recent case from Yakima where this woman was in her kitchen making salsa uh, at 12.30, they, they checked on her, and then they found her shortly after with severe strokes, stroke scale of 21. That's what we're talking about, hemiparetic, hemineglect, maybe mute, okay? So um, <clears throat> she was brought to the local hospital, so within an hour or so, they had a CT, and uh, so there's this reference to aspect score. Nobody's talked about that yet, but basically it's just a formalized way to look at a head CT and count regions of injury, add them together, and give a score. And normal is 10, because there's 10 regions, and the lower it is, the worse it is, the more volume of brain that's already injured on CT. So we like a higher aspect score. So her aspect score is 
normal, so CT is normal, and they get a multi-phase CTA with just in, in, within minutes. See that? CT 1359, CTA multi-phase 1403. We are not talking about calling in the MRI tech and you know transporting the patient upstairs. You know how much time is going by. This is just, you, you know, already have the IV, you do a CT, multi-phase CTA. An incredible amount of information. It's just got obtained. So within five minutes, okay? And that shows an M1 occlusion um, and favorable collaterals. <clears throat> so I'm gonna try and show you, let's see how well this predicts or projects. So here's our normal head CT at about 1400. And here is a multi-phase CTA. I need the mouse again. Mouse. <laughs> um, so if you click on the one on the left, click on the one on the left. So you know this, the grayscale doesn't come out that well. But this is how you do it. It's a multi-phase CT. But the way it's projected is called MIP, max any intensity projection. And what it does, it does is it compresses things together, kind of, and it makes instead of the arteries all being dots, they become lines because it's a lot easier to see a line that stops versus a dot that on one slice suddenly disappears. Just makes the conspicuity much greater. And this it may not be the very best example, but this occlusion is right there. See those lines stop. But if you see enough of them, but m many are way more obvious than that because you see this thing coming out and it just doesn't go anywhere. So we got a occlusion. And then uh, let's see on the, yeah, that one. This is the first phase. Look at the left hemisphere. And look at all the middle cerebral artery branches out there. I mean, there are arteries out there beyond the occlusion. Now go to the next slide. Now here's the second phase of a multi phase CTA. And what you see is there are even more. Look at that left, right? It's the left hemisphere. Uh, you're right. And so uh, let's play that again. It, what you're seeing is even more than on the other side because it's coming in later. So the other side's already washing out, but that side's just coming in. So this is just a few seconds later, right? So this patient has a good collateral pattern. Okay, you're over here, it's three hours away. Let's go for it. <clears throat> All right, so she ends up, she got straight to angio, didn't do any, any imaging. It was a door to puncture of 17 minutes or something like that at VM. There's an occlusion of the middle cerebral artery. And there's a solitaire device. Here's the new version with all the little dots. So they promote the use of this longer one now because the clot sort of tumbles down the device as you're pulling it out. So they think a longer one's better. And not only that, <clears throat> I don't know, if, I think I'll show you here in a second. We're using everything all together, all the things I showed you all together. So, but anyway, so we got some flow going with the solitaire device. And there's after, I think this was two passes to get that. And here is her MR. Uh, 24 hours later, almost no injury. This is a stroke scale of 21 that's hours out, okay? And uh, so a stroke scale of zero at 24 hours. And she's like the pictures I showed you back to normal. I mean, that's an incredible thing. Here is the um, timeline then for her, uh, what we might be able to pick out of that. <clears throat> so it was five hours to uh, full recanalization. But if you look at, okay, Dorian ER number one, is it was an hour and 20 minutes for some reason. Longer than you would like for someone who has gone down in the field. I don't know why it took that long. But then a CT in nine minutes, multi-phase CTA four minutes, and then look, three hours to get from the time the CTA was done to arrive at VM. And that, I think, is the reality. From Yakima, it's about two, two and a half hours. You had 30 minutes, you know. So from here, it's less. So you guys are quicker because you're closer. It's about I think under two hours. So we can make that two hours from here. But anyway, so then arrival to angio, two minutes, groin puncture 50 minutes later, and 37 minutes to open it up. So that adds up to five hours, 32 minutes. Okay, so this is the reality with these transfers. That, that one's hard to uh, do much more on. Okay, so now <clears throat> let's come to sort of the pinnacle of the you know 24 hour thing. Here's a 70 year old, eight year old lady that was last seen normal at, uh, what is that, 10 o'clock the night before. So her grandson went to bed, saw his mom, her grandmother on the couch, seemed to be okay. And then at seven in the morning, got woken up because there was a thud and the, do the dog started barking. So he went downstairs and found her on the floor, hemipretic, hemi neglect, you know, having a major stroke. Okay, so um, she gets brought in, stroke scale 25. I mean, that's gonna be probably fatal. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm jumping in a little to, I'll describe what we found before I show you, but so she gets a multi-phase CTA. Um, so last known normal, 10 o'clock the night before, um, but fell off the couch at 7 a.m. So it's like 14 hours, whatever that is. Um, and uh, I think I get into this timeline in a second here, but a stroke scale of 25, aspect score looked good. So the CT looked good. Um, 
and the collateral score was sort of questionable, but it looks like it might be okay. But here's where we do this CT perfusion, and I'm going to show you that. And then so on the groin puncture and so on, we go after that. All right, so here's your head CT, looks pretty good. Now this one, it looks like there's vessels there on the left, but there are just fewer of them. Um, so, because it's a little bit odd, but they are showing up. Oh, the other thing that was shown on this CT is that she has a complete carotid occlusion. I'm going to, right there. So her whole carotid is out. So you're like, well, the whole thing's gone way down, common carotid artery all the way down the neck. But her CT looks good. We got this long um, time since last known normal. Um, the perfusion, the collaterals look like they might be okay. I mean, can we save this lady? So uh, she gets the CT perfusion and look at the green versus the red. You know, it looks like very favorable. There's a lot of territory to save. Let's go for it. So here's her angio. And this is the opposite hemisphere. What it's showing you, look at on the right side, there's nothing. So there's nothing crossing that circle of Willis we talked about. There's no flow across midline. And we go to the back artery of the brain, the vertebrals, and there's nothing going forward really. I mean, this lady has no collaterals. This looks horrible. This would be the kind of thing you'd almost like, oh, let's just quit. There's no point. There's nothing, no uh, territory, you know, that's being salvaged by collaterals long enough to, long enough to give us a chance. Um, <clears throat> So uh, that looks pretty disheartening. However, we had the CT perfusion that was more encouraging. So here's her left carotid artery, com common carotid artery, completely out. And there, look, you can see clot and stuff in that thing. That looks nasty, right? We're going to try and open that and send it all up, upstream. Well, so here is the current thing. It's everything all together, the kitchen sink, so-called maximal technique. We not only use the stent trever, we also use the aspiration sucking through that catheter. In addition to that, we have a guide catheter in the neck with a balloon that we inflate that stops slow so nothing more goes upstream. So the idea is you get the aspiration catheter up onto the surface of the clot, you deploy the stent trever, then you uh, engage the clot, and then you just sort of pull it all out. And then once you get down to the neck, it's not going to get away from you because you got the balloon guide and you suck it all out of the neck. One pass, clean. So maximal technique with the idea is first pass. Because when you're doing this and then you got flow and then you're taking the stent and the stuff breaks off, then you do another run, there's more stuff elsewhere. So it's a, a strategy to try and minimize that. So this is the so-called maximal technique. So for this, mostly it's just the balloon guide. Bring a balloon guide up, inflate it, and suck. So after that, the arteries open. Most of these are a stenosis that we end up having a stent or something. She didn't really have that much stenosis. Uh, I don't know why there was clot there, but there it is at the bottom. But now we can see up at the top, you still have that distal carotid occluded. So then we, um, oh, this is the final result. It's a nice edge of it. So here's the, again the maximal technique where you have the aspiration catheter plus the stent retriever plus the balloon guide again inflated, and we end up, oops, with that. Okay, so it's open, great. And how did she do? So uh, two or 20 hours post, here's her little teeny infarct on MR, and um, there's our timeline. Oh, I'm going to come back to that. But here's this lady, okay? So she's basically back to normal. All right, so a complete save. This lady, uh, that was going to be fatal for sure. She was no doubt snatched from the jaws of death. There's no doubt about that, okay? Um, but I'm going to come back to this, but what if? Okay, so let's go back to the timeline. So in a case like this, I like to think of a best case scenario, worst case scenario. You don't know when the stroke happened. She fell off the couch at 7, but her uh, son saw her at 10. The tradition has always been last no normal one 10. Well, how do you know that? You exclude the patient with, you know, that could have been saved by some arbitrary rule. You know, you don't know that it was 10. <clears throat> and so the point of all this is that the imaging is trumping time. We can image and see, you know, whether the patient has uh, got, got salvageable brain. But uh, so by best case scenario, if she actually just had the stroke when she fell off the table, it was only two hours and 20 minutes till we had it open, which I think is what it was because she didn't have good collaterals. If you take worst case scenario, it was like 11 hours. So you see, you're not going to give the patient the chance if you assume the worst case scenario. So I think what you do with these wake up strokes, uh, or unknown, it's not just wake up stroke. There just was no one around. It's pretty common, <clears throat> is you assume the best case. Assume it just happened when you found them until imaging tells you otherwise. And we work fast to try and save you. Right now, it's just like, OK, you know, transport, slow roller, no sirens. You know, it's not treatable, and you don't do anything. 
on these pages. That's what's been going on for years, right? Look at this lady, okay? So the what if is what if <coughs> that son didn't come home and said it was 10 o'clock the night before. What if he just got back from a trip, he hadn't been there for a week, passed his mom on the couch, she was motionless, went to bed, here's a thump, gets up in the morning. When was she last seen normal? Well, I don't know, uh, a week ago. Oh, slow roller to the hospital, because it's more than 24 hours. I mean, are you crazy? You get a CT, you look at it, you do this imaging, and you find out, because it probably just happened, see? So even the 24 hours thing, in these unknown time of onsets, I don't agree with. It isn't about time anymore. It's about this imaging. So uh, the bottom line, or here's my take, talk, or take home points. Uh, so uh, there have been recent advances in, in this large vessel occlusion uh, stroke. And uh, it's now the standard of care. And what that means is when people don't get it, they might go looking for lawyers. So you just have to know that. I mean, you're going to get sued if you miss a big old stroke. They don't get a CTA. They don't get offered a thrombectomy. It's done, right? It's standard of care. There'll be lots of people that said, yeah, they would have had a lot better chance. So we have to be aware of that. Um, inclusion criteria expanding, uh, as we saw. Uh, imaging. Uh, multi-phase CTA preferably and CT perfusion is a better predictor uh, than time than time which is frequently vague you don't really know what it was and a CTA is mandatory you cannot evaluate a stroke with a non-contrast CT that's just failure so you have to get a CTA preferably multi-phase CTA because uh, you see that timing effect that I showed you where the collaterals are coming in later maybe your bolus is off so that you don't realize that there's better collaterals not to mention just pick up that it's a large vessel occlusion um, okay the central role that collaterals play results in heterogeneity of different patients they're not everyone's the same because you have different um, level of collateral so you have fast growers and slow growers so it's something to be aware of and then uh, let's work under best case scenario assumptions until imaging is proven that this patient's not a candidate so we act fast but we worry less about time of onset don't give up on these patients because they got found down with a severe stroke that might have just happened assume it just happened until imaging shows otherwise um, so I think that's it All right questions when a patient presents to Virginia Mason ED, if they're a candidate for a thrombectomy, you guys aren't doing IV TPA, right? No. Are they still yeah. So the current paradigm, so it turns out if you look at that, is it doesn't clearly make any difference whether they get the IV TPA or not um, when you uh, sort that out. Uh, but it might help. And certainly in a transport situation, better to have it on board. But it's considered standard of care not to withhold IV TPA in someone who's a candidate for it. So even if someone comes in, and that could be another like medical legal, I don't know who would challenge that these days because it doesn't, but if someone comes in, they're a candidate for IV TPA, American Stroke Association recommendations are they should get it, even if they're on their way to the angio suite. So we'll be doing thrombectomies on people that have TPA hanging. Okay. Um, we used to not. Some of the like the first case I showed you, we were worried about doing that. It's like, oh, that's going to be too much because we were giving TPA, right? But now we just don't even give TPA anymore. They've already got the IV TPA. Maybe we'll give a little if someone didn't get any. But that's already been done, so now we're just trying to pull the clot out. So it's really a thrombectomy. And uh, most of them get it, IV TPA, and all that qualify. So we'll do the ones. It turns out that if they don't qualify for some reason, they're still just as good a candidate. It's not clear it makes any difference whether they got it or not if you have an LVO. Other question? It's that growing core idea. So if you have no collaterals, oh. It's like you have no time. If you have good collaterals, the core is very slowly growing, gives you more time to try and save what ultimately will be a big infarct, but you might have 12 hours in rare patients. That doesn't mean you want to sit around, right? You guys all get that, because you don't know, and even if it looks good, that just means let's go for this, but still you're saving every minute you can. And you can find yourself saving a lot of time if you look at every one of those intervals and how you can do it better and faster for these patients. Well, it's just a de uh, developmental variation. There's a various things. One, most of it is developmental variation. So uh, some people better circle of Willis. Those are just variable. Um, but then there's also things like, you know, peel collaterals over the surface of the brain. You know, probably a younger person who has healthier arteries is going to have a little better flow than an older person with small vessel disease where all the arteries are a little diseased. And the peel collaterals over the surface of the brain are not going to be as robust as somebody who is 
younger. If someone happens to have had, say, a pre-existing stenosis of an artery, they might get big PO collaterals because they kind of develop over time. And then if they lose the artery, they've got pre-existing pretty good collaterals there. So there's those sorts of things. A lot of it's developmental. All right. So act fast, but worry a little less about time of onset. And get the imaging. It has to be a CTA, better multi-phase CTA.